Um, why don't we go ahead and get started? I suspect a few more people will join, um, but um, I think it must just try to stay on schedule. I know we have a lot to cover. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Todd Rolapp, um, and I am uh, the managing partner at Bass, Barry & Sims, but more importantly, uh, I serve as the chair for Moving Forward. Um, moving Forward, uh, I hope some of you are familiar with us, but for those of you who are not, is it's dedicated to creating uh, regional transportation solutions that work for Middle Tennessee. Uh, we're an organization of volunteers, uh, and our goal is to empower businesses, the community, uh, and transit thought leaders uh, to engage on really critical transportation issues uh, that face our area or our region. And of course, we know those uh, issues are, are critical. Um, both transit and mobility are critical to the quality of life for, for us and for Middle Tennesseans and are really important in ensuring that uh, our residents have access to jobs, education, and amenities. Um, you know, we've seen growth in, in Middle Tennessee, even throughout the pandemic. And this just emphasizes that investment in transition is really important, um, not only for the continued growth and quality of life in Middle Tennessee, but as research by Transportation for America has shown, cities that invest in transit during and emerging from things like this pandemic experience larger and more equitable recovery. So um, I think we all know as our community, ben our community benefits when we invest in transit and when all Middle Tennesseans can have access to affordable, convenient, dependable mobility and transportation. So, and as we have consistently called for uh, at Moving Forward, um, this requires greater funding uh, and a commitment to equitable investment. So with that sort of overview, um, Today, we're extremely fortunate to have a great panel from Austin, Texas, uh, talking to us about Austin's journey in this area. Uh, and I know some of you may know these folks already, but let me quickly introduce them. Jackie Nuremberg is the manager of community involvement for Capital Metro Austin. We have Sam Sargent with us, who is the director of program strategy, uh, Capital Metro in Austin and Meg Merritt, who is with uh, Movitas Mobility. Um, just before I kick it over to them to lead us through a conversation, um, as a reminder, we're gonna leave time for questions at the end of the program. So please place questions that you have in the chat feature and we will try to get to all those as best we can. Uh, so in, with that being said, please welcome our panel. Jackie, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I thought maybe it might be helpful if Meg uh, gave us a you know quick background and, and, and explanation of what she does at Movitas and what that organization does, if that would be helpful. I think, I think your role and Sam's role are, are fairly um, clear from the title and from, from other programs we've done, but maybe we could start with that. And then Jackie, I'm gonna let you lead us from there. All right. Sure, hi everybody. Um, I'm Meg and I, as we were talking about, I work for Movitas, which is a firm that I started about a year ago. Um, but before that, I was with Nelson Nygaard on a big team with AECOM and a bunch of other consultants. And we worked very much hand in hand with Capital Metro in trying to develop graphics and do a technical analysis of the corridors that really warranted high capacity transit. So I'm, I'm here today to talk a little bit of how we got there. I know that mode was a particular interest to this group. So we'll talk about some of that history and uh, I'll try to recall some of my uh, understanding here with Jackie and Sam is how we arrived at a lot of these decisions. Um, so that's my role today. I, I still work on the program and lucky enough to work with Jackie and Sam still. Um, and when you get to that phase of the program, we're happy to share our, our insights on, on this phase too. So happy to be here today and thanks everybody for having us. Thanks, Meg. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Jackie Nirenberg, um, as Todd told you, and we're so pleased. It's always so fun for us to connect with um, a community like Nashville. We have so many similarities, um, so many of the same aspirations. And, and frankly, before our election, we had looked to you all for uh, best practices and your journey. Um, and so it's, it's just great to have that collaboration and we're always happy to come speak to you all about our experience. I'm gonna share my screen really quickly. 
um, and get started. Let's see. There we go. Can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. Let me get on the slide presentation here. There we go. Oops. It's not letting me click. There we go. All right. So um, just as, as a review, in case some of you don't know much about what, what uh, Project Connect is and how we got here, um, in November of 2020, Austin passed a, an in, incredibly large and historic transit investment plan. Um, and um, it took about four years for us to get there. So I'm gonna walk us through a little bit of that story. Um, and then as Meg said, she's gonna to talk to you a little bit more about specifics of how mode was selected and some of the um, work we did on that. And then Sam will kind of bring it home with where we are now and what this plan looks like moving forward. So many of you may have uh, come to Austin to visit. Um, as you know, like Nashville, uh, Austin has become an it city, which, it, you know, it has its benefits, it has its drawbacks, um, but we have come to be known for everything from music festivals to tacos and food trucks, Mexican martinis, and if you haven't had a Mexican martini yet, we can talk about that after this presentation, you must try that, wonderful libation, um, so, you know, Little by little over the years, Austin's quirky reputation, uh, reputation for creative arts, and of course music just like Nashville, um, it, it made it a, a hugely popular destination for people to visit. And often people would come, especially if they're not coming during the summer and here in the spring, say for South by Southwest, weather's fabulous. Uh, and they end up deciding that they want to stay. And that's all wonderful and exciting, except for this is where we are now and have been for the last probably 15 years, spending, I think last year, about five days of our lives sitting in traffic, which is astounding and depressing and terrible for both physical and mental health. Um, and so we knew and that that something had to be done. And it, it's not the first time that we tried to address that issue, um, but it's certainly gotten to the point where even during the pandemic, the traffic has been just untenable. Um, used to take us about 15 minutes to get from one side of town to the other. And that can be about an hour to an hour and 30 minutes now, depending on what time. So. As I mentioned, we had tried this before. Um, in 2000, there was a light rail referendum and that was defeated by less than 1%. So that was a real heartbreaker for our community. That was a presidential election year. Um, I believe it was uh, George W. Bush's election year. Um, 2004, we had a rail referendum for our commuter service, which did pass, it passed with 67% of the vote. Um, and one of the reasons that it passed so easily was because we already own the rail infrastructure, heavy rail infrastructure um, on which freight service runs, continues to run. And um, so it was a, a much easier pill to swallow for the community. And that rail, commuter rail service is still running today and enhancements to that service are part of this Project Connect program expansion. Um, and then in 2014, oops, sorry about that. Let's go back. Oh no. Well, I'll just talk it. Uh, I, in 2014, we had another election for light rail. It was urban rail. Um, and that one was defeated fairly soundly by about uh, 58 or 57 percent of the community. And then finally, 2020, where we managed to pass with almost the inverse of where we were in, uh, in 2014. And our post-mortem on 2014, and I'm sure this is the same for you all in Nashville, began the day after that uh, election failed. And so we really quickly began to talk about lessons learned and, and how we can do better the next time. We knew we were gonna go for it again. Um, one of the things that changed was that the growth accelerated even more so from 2014. So 
Um, the newest predictions, demographic predictions showed that by 2040, we were going to double our population to 4 million. So what, what we decided was that the, one of the things that the community was looking for that we didn't communicate effectively the last time around was that people needed to see the entire system of projects. The 2014 election was one rail alignment. And so if you didn't live around that rail alignment or work around it, you were probably thinking to yourself, that's a lot of money to spend on something that's not gonna help me. And ultimately we all know that that's how people think about these things is what can it do for me? Um, and so when we went back out to the community, we knew we were gonna have, have to package it as a full system. And Project Connect, the system included night, new light rail, um, a downtown transit tunnel with three underground stations, uh, a new bus rapid transit service, uh, actually four new bus rapid transit routes, new micro transit circulator services, um, expanded local bus service, enhanced commuter rail service, new park and ride facilities, and an all electric fleet. So the way it all came together was that um, we had to do an extensive amount of community engagement. Obviously we engaged with over 70,000 people and really tried to focus on our customers, the people that need it most, because honestly, if you uh, solve for people who need this most, you're gonna solve for everyone. And that kind of kept us laser focused on communities that had been historically under-resourced and marginalized, um, and also communities of color and young people. And young people were a real key uh, to our success this time around with Project Connect. We had loads of people moving to town and I suspect that's the same for Nashville uh, to work particularly in Austin in the tech industry. A lot of those folks who came to Austin were arrived here and wondering where's the transit? How am I supposed to get to work? You know, they're used to living in Los Angeles or Chicago or Boston or New York, um, San Francisco. So that was, you know, a, a target audience that we really focused on in terms of educating and, um, and getting people up to speed on what we were offering. We also had, we were lucky to have a visionary mayor um, and city council and a new CEO, Randy Clark, who joined us in 2018, who is a take no prisoners disruptor, um, doggedly driven to make this happen. And, you know, those three visionary leaders uh, or groups of leaders uh, made a huge difference in, in being able to move this forward because they, they had the political will and courage um, to, to break some eggs along the way. Um, partnerships were also incredibly important for our community engagement effort. You know, I mentioned that we wanted to focus um, on our customers and people who needed this the most. And some of those communities, frankly, don't trust uh, Capital Metro or any government agency to, to, for that matter, because historically ha they have been ignored and underserved. Um, and in Austin's case, relegated to their own part of town. <laughs> so, you know, that history has made it more difficult for us to connect authentically and for us to build trust with those groups. Partnerships with organizations helped us to connect with those communities because the organizations that had already built trust with those com communities were able to deliver messages and participants in our public engagement process. Um, and we also have ex had extensive outreach with neighborhood leaders, business leaders, community activists. Some of these were obviously di diametrically opposed in terms of their interests. Um, and so finding a way to build consensus around all that was a real challenge. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Meg, who's gonna talk a little bit about mode and the important role that it played in getting us where we are. Thanks, Jackie. So I know that um, <clears throat> overcoming the mode obsession by the public is something you're, pro you're probably facing. Um, it's hard enough with the discussion of bus rapid transit and any type of rail service. Then you also have pundits who want to talk about autonomous vehicles, and in our case, gondolas, because we have a water crossing. So we had a lot to overcome and really just a lot of noise in the marketplace and confusion. 
So we took it back a few steps and wanted to teach folks, both business leaders and the general public and property owners in the area, kind of key tenants of why high capacity transit is so important. So we used that terminology, high capacity transit, because we didn't quite know the mode yet, and we knew that we needed to do more analysis to discern the mode. So what we effectively did is, is refocus people on throughput. Um, it used to be that traffic engineers would measure success by how many cars got through an intersection in a minute. But when your city is bursting at the seams and on your arterials that, you know, really taking property and tearing down buildings to make six more lanes is, you know, not a reality. We wanted to focus people on person throughput. So we built this graphic. Uh, it's a GIF. And they, you know, played on the news reels quite a bit. And that really helped people understand that dedicated right of way was going to be key to this. And we really, when people ask a lot about mode at, in the early phases, we, we tried to say, don't, don't worry about that yet. The math will help us understand mode, but first we need to basically make sure that we better understand the value of dedicated lanes. Also, you, we heard a lot of uh, noise in the marketplace about, yeah, but nobody takes transit. And well, A, that was false. Capital Metro ridership numbers uh, were very, very strong at this point, of course, before the pandemic. And B, we knew that um, travel time is something that could only increase ridership. If you, if you have reduced travel time, it would be competitive with the automobile and therefore attract more ridership. So the only way to get there was dedicated right away. So we did sort of an education campaign and public outreach about those tenants first. You can go to the next slide, Jackie. And then we sort of evolved the conversation to um, helping people understand that there was a lot of discussion about autonomous vehicles. Uh, if, if you're hearing that, you can imagine in Austin with, uh, this is before Tesla announced they were coming here, but nonetheless, we have a really tech savvy community. So a lot of obsession in the business community with autonomous vehicles. Um, and one thing we evolved the teaching to include is that if you want to future proof the city, you have to have dedicated right away. Don't worry about all the technology and advancements that will come. We will do things within the technical team and within engineering to look at and anal uh, analyze different ways of getting there. But first we need to talk about travel time being competitive and dedicated right away. So the next phase of the evolution of that, you can go to the next slide, was teaching folks, taking it back to a very simple level um, about bus rapid transit and light rail transit. So we, this is a little pedantic, but we thought it would be good for people to understand that yes, BRT is high capacity, and we can assume that we will use an electric fleet. That was one of the commitments the project made early on as part of this future proving. And then um, we, this is just a graphic that explains that. And then the next slide is light rail. Um, just teaching like really, like you walk into the room, this is back when public meetings were in person. These are the first two things you saw so that people understand when we talk about LRT, what we mean. And then you go to the next slide. Um, after that, we wanted to have a real conversation with folks about capacity. So in the early phases of the ridership model, it was looking like the main corridors. Let me let me just back up one one minute. Um, we talked about this in our and I know it in June that one of the criticisms of previous campaigns is that the network didn't have something for everyone. So in this referendum, we really took to the voters a plan that had a corridor, that had many corridors and really had a wide geographic spread. But which corridors warranted light rail was the subject of a study that AECOM did that, I mean, for the layperson, really all you need to understand is it's, it's a matter of math and travel demand. 
And the travel demand on the orange and blue lines were such that we were starting to wonder if BRT was going to become obsolete from a capacity standpoint very shortly after it was built. Um, and so in order to get the public to make that logic leap with us before we unveiled that data point, we first had to campaign on the differences between BRT and LRT from a capacity standpoint. So this is an example of a poster that we showed and then the next slide uh, was just next to it. And so instantly you're going, oh, okay, so I see LRT can carry more people. Of course, LRT vehicles can actually couple together and in transit, they call that um, coupling. And therefore one operator can, can drive a vehicle that actually is too attached to it, three or in our case, potentially four in the future. So that was, that was like part of that um, evolution of understanding. And then on the next slide, this is an example of how we try to, again, we're, we're, much, we're very much like Nashville. Like we have a, a strong population of transit interested folks, but not necessarily everyday transit riders who we would need to understand this concept before they would feel the confidence to vote yes. So we did this education component where we talked about how many people per hour we could carry. Um, and then on the next slide, again, this, these two posters were side by side and it's pretty evident, of course, that light rail carries more people. So that was how we did the teaching campaign. Now, during the same time, we were looking at the corridors that warranted higher capacity and we knew that three or four corridors were going to be a really good candidate for BRT. So we were killing two birds with one stone really because BRT has so many great merits and is a really appropriate mode for many of the corridors in town. But it was going to, in fact, once the math came out, um, looks like, and I'm just gonna give you all some, some rough numbers here. So while we were doing the study, we did have an existing like BRT light, I'll call it corridor. We call it the 801. It's what is going to become the orange line light rail corridor. And our, it had roughly 11,500 people per day. And it was getting tight. Some people were already complaining on Twitter that it would pass them because it was full. This is like 2019. And so we did have leverage in this conversation because when we talked about if we got the most juice for the squeeze and we really vamped up the operations on the 801, the most we could get out of that is about 15,000 people a day. And that was our no build scenario. If you're familiar with the alternatives analysis, you go through a very scientific control group and so forth. And the control group is the no build and the no build really was not gonna meet the demands of the growing population. So um, we were showing that the ridership demand, if we were to put BRT on, would be roughly 45,000 to 66,000 uh, boardings a day. Now we, uh, that, that's like, depending on what you do the intersections, that's why there's a, a range. And then with LRT, 54,000, to 74,000 a day. And again, compared to 11,500 for the existing line. So what that meant is, well, it'll take us to 2030 to build this thing to, even if it was light rail, it might, I mean, if it was BRT, and then 10 years later, we would be leaving people at the curb. So in terms of an investment, we really try to help people understand it's looking like, folks, if we want to get the most for our investment, that LRT is a more appropriate solution for the orange line and the blue line. Um, and we expected a lot of pushback on that, and we didn't get it because the numbers really uh, held a watertight case for us. So that's just a, a quick history in a nutshell of how we got to that conclusion. Um, and again, it, it, it went over very well. And I think it's because we took the time to walk people through the logic of how the mode choice was transparent and really one of travel demand.
All right. Well, I will pick it up from Meg, but Meg is, is exactly right, uh, as is Jackie, is that this involved a lot of community education and it involved a lot of Transit 101 because like your community, I do think that Austin has a lot of people who are very interested in transit or at least transit as a concept, but didn't yet know how it all comes together or what type of investment to make or what's actually going to make a difference in your community. And Jackie walked through some of our previous uh, successes and failures uh, with making large investments in transit infrastructure, which I always like to remind people even locally that's really what we're talking about. Because sometimes we would go out and talk to people and they might say, oh, it'll be great once we have transit. Well, we have transit. In fact, we run a very great system of bus and commuter rail and paratransit and on-demand transit, but we as a community had not yet invested in the dedicated infrastructure to make transit move better and to move a whole lot more people. And I know that that's really where Nashville finds itself it's where San Antonio is, and it's where Phoenix was 25 years ago. And, and we frequently use Phoenix as, a, as an example because they're a fairly recent Sunbelt community that invested in quite a bit of light rail transit. And so that is where we find us, but it's building that culture of transit. It's explaining the why, and it's explaining what is in it for you, but what's in it for your neighbors. And so I think that one thing that really won the day for us before I talk about these specific components of the initial investment plan for Project Connect is that the map that we put out there this time around had something in it for everybody. And I think it's perfectly fine to have a, a publicly funded program that speaks to what works for people. It's okay to be self-interested. But at the same time, we not only were able to sell the benefits of congestion relief or congestion management, but also equity, sustainability, affordability, all of the different things that transit does really well that speak to people in different kinds of people when you're out there telling your story or selling transit, however you want to term it. And I think that we did a really good job of not only showing a map that worked for everybody, explaining the problem, but also telling people how many different ways and how many problems can be solved with an investment in transit. So after uh, the last failure in 2014, we probably started right afterwards. In fact, Jackie and I began at Capital Metro at the very beginning of 2015. And ultimately we developed a, uh, a plan that was very robust um, and is very robust. And then the pandemic hit and we had to make a decision well, all of this momentum we've gotten in Austin of rising transit ridership and lots of great stories coming out of both the city and Capital Metro, what do we do? And ultimately, the problem hadn't changed that we were trying to solve, and we continued to move forward. And so the system that was put to voters as Proposition A in November uh, had a mix of light rail and commuter rail, including commuter rail improvements to our existing red lines. Uh, 27 miles and 31 stations, a downtown transit tunnel, which as a native Austinite uh, is something I never imagined I would get to work on, let alone vote on, um, to put the downtown portions of our light rail alignment underground. But we also wanted to make sure that we were investing heavily in bus. So Meg talked about bus rapid transit. We are investing in four new Metro Rapid or bus rapid transit routes. Um, as well as a new gold line, which is a bus rapid transit route that could later be converted into light rail, but then also adding new park and rides, new on-demand transit, new um, Metro Bike, which is our bike uh, share service that Capital Metro now operates um, uh, in partnership with a nonprofit in the city of Austin, and then improvements to maintenance facilities, customer technology, and as was mentioned before, switching to an all-electric or zero-emission fleet. And so all of this shows a system. It's not just one line on a map. It is something that works together and it's something that spoke to a large swath of the community. In fact, 57% of voters, 237,000 folks voted yes. And I think that it was in large part because of how we told the story and how we told it in a way that worked for a lot of different kinds of people. So what you're seeing right here, this is the initial investment. Our hope is that not only do we pull this off, which is what voters approved in Proposition A over the course of this decade, and I'll show a timeline in just a moment, 
but that there is still a little bit more than the initial investment. So if we do everything right, maybe we're like Seattle or Los Angeles or Phoenix, where voters and policymakers entrust us with an expansion later on in the decade or maybe in the next decade. Next slide, Jackie. And then this is just a quick series of maps that Jackie, you can uh, click forward to, because I don't expect everybody to, uh, to know Austin front and back, but you can see there are a lot of lines on this map. It is a complicated map, and that's a good thing. It shows how much was put out there to voters and how many parts of our community it touched. And we are a community of people who have lived here for decades, if not generations, and we're also a community full of people who have been here for a couple of months. And so we couldn't just invest in the places that had been asking for it for 20 years. We needed to not only invest where the people are today and where the growth is, um, on these long-term corridors, uh, but also on the edges of our MSA. I mean, just like Nashville, I believe with the last count from the census, you all grew as an MSA by about 20 to 21%. Also is about 33%, but I would still say that anything in that range is going to require new investments in mobility. And so we were able, again, to speak to the newcomers and the old timers um, and the level of detail in this map and the fact that it touched so many different places, I think is really what won the day. Next slide. And then here's our initial investment sequence. So again, this is what was shown to voters and to policymakers for Proposition A, and it shows what you saw on the map and what you saw before on the elements uh, and puts it into time. So the orange line and blue line, which would be brand new light rail investments, would be built in parallel. Uh, the blue line goes from the airport to downtown. The orange line goes from far south Austin up south Congress into downtown. And then they run together through downtown in a tunnel to the university and then north to a location called North Lamar Transit Center that's an existing Capital Metro uh, property. Working on some near-term improvements to our existing metro rail, uh, which is commuter rail, like what Nashville has, but doing more double tracking, trying to get our frequencies up and making a host of other improvements, including a new station at our brand new MLS stadium, which is very exciting. And then another commuter line out to the east, the green line, much later in the program. Metro Rapid, as I mentioned before, is bus rapid transit. So working on that in the nearer term, and we are, um, we are working, these would be covered with uh, federal small starts grant funds, whereas light rail would be new starts uh, since they're a far larger investment. And then you can see park and ride improvements and really other new investments in the existing capital metro operation, whether it be bus, paratransit for folks with disabilities, customer technology. And then last and absolutely not least, because this was such a critical part of our program is what we're terming transit supportive investments or anti-displacement investments. You can think of this uh, as a variety of things. I think that the most simple way to phrase it is affordability and likely affordable housing or something that keeps people where they live today. But it's important to note that we had a multi-billion dollar package of transit investments out there with a $300 million investment in affordability inside of there. Had that $300 million been standing on its own as a ballot initiative, I believe that it would have been the third largest investment in, again, call it affordable housing or affordability in the country. And so it's small as a percentage of the multi-billion dollar program, but the impact is going to be enormous. And the idea behind it is how do we lock in affordability in a city that is growing rapidly, which means that our land values and rents are rising rapidly, just like I'm sure that they are in Nashville and Middle Tennessee, lock them in now, and then you are able to put more people who are gonna need transit the most on these corridors so that you're not only locking in that ridership, but you're also making sure that you're gonna have a mix of people and a mix of incomes and demographics up and down these corridors. And there are a lot of really interesting things that can be done. Uh, land banking, for instance, because when you're trying to do a large construction project in the middle of an already urban environment, you are going to need things like construction laydown yards. And so how do we make sure that we've got the space to build, but then when we're done with that, that land can be turned over to even better uses. We saw that in Seattle and a couple of other places. And so I'm really excited uh, about how this part of the program is going to work. I hope that it winds up being a model for other cities uh, as they pursue transit investments. And we're working 
hand in hand with our partners at the city of Austin, including the equity office and the anti-displacement officer at the city of Austin on how to, how to best um, coordinate those investments. But so here you can see the schedule. We have a lot of work to do over the rest of this decade. It is incredibly exciting, but we are working to not only build a game-changing program in our city, but to build a culture of transit. And that takes partnership, that takes a lot of voices, it takes a lot of people with a lot of different perspectives, just like we have here in the webinar, to go out to your communities and your networks and talk to people about transit on their terms. Go to them, you know, get, get introductions from other people so that you're not just going in cold. And I think that was a huge part of how we sold Proposition A and Project Connect this time around and how we've built uh, a long-term network of transit supporters. So it's very exciting. And I know that Jackie, Meg, and I are very uh, excited for, for what Nashville and Middle Tennessee have, have next. So I think that may be it for the deck, Jackie. There we go. Thanks, Todd. Wow. Uh, thank you very much, um, Jackie, uh, Meg, and Sam. That was great. We do have a couple questions. Um, and, and since I am the moderator, I get to ask my question first, um, and I'm going to take that uh, liberty. But I'm, I'm curious. I think you had an idea for what the vote was in 2020. Sam, I think you said 62, 67 percent in 57. favor. 57. Oh, 57. Okay. But it felt like 67. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 57. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, I misheard that. Um, I'm interested in in what the main opposition arguments were and who made up those voices. And then I'm also interested in, in what the sources of financing were, or the components of the financing that, that was approved. I mean, we have some very specific requirements here in Middle Tennessee and limitations. So maybe you could talk about those details for the group. Jackie and Meg, do you want me to Yeah, to go start? for it, Sam. Oh, okay. Sure. So um, that's a great question, Todd, and it's definitely an important one as you all look at whatever your next community decision on this might be. Um, I would say that the opposition included a lot of longtime opponents of transit investments who tended to be in the suburbs and uh, or in actually this whole vote was within the city of Austin. I should note that. Um, and I'll speak to, to what that means in terms of how this is being funded. But, you know, there were areas that were lower density, uh, more affluent, less traditionally supportive of transit, and that didn't change in certain places. And then I do think that there were also folks who were concerned about displacement. And that has been um, the case in some other places that have had votes that have not, not worked, uh, where you have a mix of people who are more affluent anti-transit, and then less affluent who are worried about displacement or, or whatever the, the reason might be. And I do think that that mixture made up the 40 to 43% of people who voted no. I do think that the heat map of the vote was very different than what we saw in 2014 or 2000, where you had single lines that went out to voters. And of course, the people who voted no were away from those lines. So we had a really good distribution of yes votes, but I do think that the anti-folks uh, their main issue was either uh, anti-displacement gentrification or uh, cost too much, does too little. That's always been the slogan uh, here among the, the pro-road anti-transit folks. The vote, Proposition A, was actually for a property tax, which is a very unique thing in the transit world uh, for a capital project. So the scale of the Project Connect program uh, and some quirks in Texas statute mean that Capital Metro could not levy any more sales tax, which is how the transit authority is funded, one penny sales tax, could not uh, levy a property tax on its own and could not bond for anything near what we needed to build this. The city also wasn't in a position to bond for that amount of money right up front and doing a bond wouldn't have covered long-term operations and maintenance. So the solution was a vote on an additional 8.75 cent uh, property tax to cover not only capital, but long-term operations and maintenance. And that is owned by the city of Austin. And that money is transferred to the Austin Transit Partnership, which is the entity that's been set up by Capital Metro in the city to build the program. So 
is a property tax first and foremost, and we are working towards federal matching funds. Great, thank you. Um, and we've got some great questions in the chat section. I think I'm gonna, uh, Al, who's, who's a part of Moving Forward Leadership, ask some great questions about getting uh, the, the freight rail owners to share the rail with you, but I think there's an answer to that in the chat, but we'll circle back to that as a result so we can get to these other questions. Stay, um, we have we struggle with state regulation with respect to implementing affordable housing. Does Texas have similar restrictions, and and how are you able to handle that if you do? And then the other question we'll go ahead and ask is: We had a tunnel component of our uh, referendum proposal um, that was controversial um, for a number of reasons, but but one reason was downtown businesses concerned about you know the tunnel impact on their business. Did you have any issues with that? Maybe you could tackle those two quickly or, or whatever you need. Take as much time as you need. Go ahead. <laughs> Jack here, Meg, do you want to uh, tackle the tunnel question? Sure. Just since it's about business owner Yeah, yeah. So it was interesting. There were concerns about the tunnel downtown, but far more excitement about it than there were concerns. And I think that um, the, cons the, the bigger concern would be if we were to put the light rail on the street downtown, I think our businesses downtown would have been even more worried about the impact of that. Um, there were lots of safety concerns that the tunnel allowed us to address, um, pedestrian and bike and vehicular conflicts, utility conflicts. Um, so surprisingly, our community was pretty pumped about the downtown tunnel. Uh, once we unveiled that, we didn't hear a whole lot of pushback surprisingly. Um, except for the cost, which of course, it's the biggest chunk of, of spending that we're gonna do on this program is that downtown tunnel. Um, and so, and we also talked about the importance of the downtown tunnel in establishing and maintaining reliability and fluidity of the system and keeping it running in a reliable way. So those messages somehow really hit home for people. Um, Sam or Meg, was, were there any other oppositions to the tunnel that you all can think of? Um, I think people are concerned, were concerned and are concerned about construction time, but because now there is a false perception that tunneling down under downtown is out of sight, out of mind, which is not actually true because you got to put the machine in, you got to take it out. And in order to make a station, you have to um, basically make a big hole in the ground to access it. Like this is the tunnel and here's your station. So it opens the ground up and can close blocks and it's, it's gonna be a headache, um, but it's less of a headache than the cross traffic and the slowing down of the train that it would, ha that would have been had it been street running through downtown. We have pretty constrained right of way downtown and moving it is a, you know pretty much non-negotiable. So um, when we kind of were, we actually had a group of business leaders downtown and we would like try on these things for size and say, what do you think about this, about this? And we would diagram it out. And over and over, the long-term implications for traffic flow downtown were really what convinced them to want a tunnel. Um, and the advice that we got from Seattle and Portland was we wish we, we would have right when we started because it's a lot harder to get money to then go back and do a tunnel Whereas if you nest it into your initial New Starts program, it's, it's uh, so much easier. That program that Portland is exploring is called like Core Connectivity, which is just for tunnels. That's what DART is doing also in Dallas. Uh, yeah, and actually Dallas was another one that said like, start off with the tunnel. Um, so there's economies of scale doing it that way. And because we have this vote of confidence from the community to go big, this time we were like, all right, let's do it. Um, now I know that Nashville, this is a bit of an Achilles heel for Nashville. The tunnel was part of the kind of rhetoric out there that helped sink the last election. So, you know, if you all get closer to that, I think you will have to change the angle completely on how you tell that story. Um, hopefully the press on our tunnel is going well at the time so that <laughs> you can use that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, uh, well, we won't know if we were super happy about it for another 10 years, um, <laughs> but let's talk then. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's I, I just oh, want to add Jackie. one, 
I just want to add one thing to that. The other thing that we did with the tunnel that I think was really successful is to show beautiful renderings of placemaking opportunities that the tunnel provided, you know, underground retail and public art exhibitions and live music performances. And then the other thing is that, you know, Austin is really hot. <laughs> and so the idea of being able to access um, transit options underground in an air conditioned space was really attractive for people too. Because when you walk downtown in the summertime here, it is sweltering. I, you know, we're close to 100 degrees most days um, in the summer. So I think those two things also have, so eye candy is important. Yeah, great. Um, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, along the lines of going big, Meg, I think you used that term. Um, there was there were some voices in our last referendum who felt like there was too much and it was too big and in in X billion dollars, I think it was six or whatever it was, was too much. If they, I would I would have supported this if it had been smaller. But at the same time, you also mentioned that the key to this was something for everybody. There's a, there was an element of your presentation that said, touch all groups, you know, make sure people see how this is gonna be benefit them. That's, those are a little bit um, contradictory, I guess, um, you, know, oh, go, you know, but I'd be, and so I'd be interested in your views on that. Um, you know, if you could have any advice for us on that and, and with the context of this being, it, when, if we do this again, it would be our second time around. Sam, Jackie? I, I'll, I'll start from the community engagement standpoint. I think what's really helpful is to dig down to the neighborhood level and, and engage groups where these particular projects are going to be and talk to them about the projects that are going to impact their neighborhoods and why um, they can be beneficial from an economic development, equity, access standpoint. Um, I think those conversations at a much more focused and, and um, granular level help sort of cobble together the entire system and, and make it relevant for everyone. I, I don't know if I'm making sense, but um, yeah. it, it, it's about having those, those very focused conversations on each piece of that system, I think will help. Um, and bringing it home to these, these you know, people at the neighborhood level that this is what it's gonna do for you. And also yeah. the, the importance of connectivity it was another message. And, and you know, as Sam mentioned, Austin doesn't know very much about transit. Um, and so uh, explaining why all the pieces have to fit together to create a much more reliable system and a much more seamless experience on transit was part of that education process that I think sold the bigger system. I, I agree. And, and again, it's it's building that culture of transit. So you're not talking down to people, but you're educating them on what transit can do, but also how it will work as a system. So that somebody who lives on the orange line or lives on the red line realizes that, okay, well, if I don't live on the blue line, let's say, here's how I can still get to the airport. So this is still going to be a net benefit for me and for my neighbors and, and teaching people about that, especially when you're in a community that just doesn't have as much of a reference point for transit as a Los Angeles or a Seattle, or of course, a New York or a Chicago. And so you have to bring people along. And I think what Jackie described in terms of how you get out there and talk to people about this, you have to not only have those granular conversations where oftentimes you are being you, the transit advocate, or maybe it's somebody from the agency or the city or the county, are being introduced by somebody who already has that built-in trust mm -hmm. in their community, whether it's a faith community, a PTA, a neighborhood, uh, a merchants association, or when you're trying to tell the broad story, which is also where we had great partners in Austin, when you have the chamber or the real estate council of Austin, somebody who's able to speak at the full map level, not just the stationary level. That goes a really long way towards having this two-pronged strategy of telling the story of what this is gonna do for people. And Todd, you also mentioned, um, you know, some of the, the hesitancy, it sounds like in Nashville early on over the price tag last time around. And I do think that it was interesting how we socialized the, the billions of, of anything. In fact, I think <laughs> Austin had only gone out for one bond over a billion dollars. I could be wrong about that, but it's not, the B word is not one that Austin is familiar <laughs> with in terms of a government investment. 
Um, and so when we went out there, we had the vision map in 2019, which was the full, if we build everything, here's what it's going to look like and here's approximately what it's going to cost. And as people got comfortable with that, and at the time, I think it was a 10 point something billion dollar vision plan. Then when we had the initial investment that was 7.1 billion, it actually didn't seem as extreme. And, and I think that it was just, it was part of that education process of these things cost money. Here is what Seattle did and here's what it cost. Here is what Phoenix did and here's what it cost. And that went a really long way. And then the other thing too, is that at some point, if the problem feels big enough and for call it congestion, call it affordability, whatever it might be, people are willing to invest in the solution. And, and I think that this time around they were because we put a problem out there that people nodded their heads about and agreed on. Um, and then there was also a little bit of an element, and maybe this would be the case in Nashville of, this is costing this much because we didn't invest sooner. And it was sort of a community admission that we should have invested in this earlier, but we are certainly willing to do it now. Yeah, that's great. I will ask one last question. Eric posted this and, and I think it's related to what we're talking about. And, and by the way, there's some great content in the chat room and, and I know we're not getting to all the questions, but thank you uh, panelists for answering some of those as we're going along. Um, is, what's your view on, you know, you, 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 you say the source of funding and then you, you, you give a description of the project and how specific you should be and how specifically dedicated the funding is to specific projects. In other words, I remember sort of discussions of whether you're better asking for money for the conceptual problem or you're better asking for the money for very specific projects that are, that are more locked in. Do you have a view on what worked best for you all on that? I think that we, I think that a big difference between the previous two failed referendums and this one was that we did get fairly specific about not only where the money was coming from, we also had a graphic on what percentage of, a per, of an average homeowner's property tax in 2021, let's call it, would look like and what it would cost them per year for this investment. And part of that was to uh, manage some misinformation that was out there about the percentage increase of people's property taxes that this was going to lead to. But we also got quite specific about, yeah, it, it is going to cost money, but it's not going to cost as much as those folks are saying it will, but here's how much it is going to cost. And we did break the projects down by, uh, by cost, because we've always described Project Connect as a program of projects. And so we broke down those individual costs, knowing that they were conceptual and that they would change. And in fact, they, they likely will change. Um, but we did break them down more specifically. And I, I think that that helped build a lot of trust. I, I'd like Definitely. to think that it helped with trust at the neighborhood level, but it certainly helped with trust at the policymaker, council, chamber, business leaders standpoint of this is not just a pot of money for these folks to go and build the thing, they, they know what they're doing. And, and I would just end by saying, selling your competence is enormous. And, and especially when you're in a community that doesn't have that reference point for transit saying, we know what we are doing. You don't have to take us just at our word. We're not gonna, we're not gonna pretend like that's acceptable, but take us at our word and here's why and we, you know, here's, here are the, here's the background of Meg Merritt. Here's the background of our whole project team. And we're going to give you a level of detail that makes you know we have done our homework. Um, so I think that the level of specificity, at least in our case, went a long way. And that may just be Austin. People do expect here to get a lot of detailed information about projects. And so we, we were able to give it to them. Yeah, and I'd just like to add that transparency and authenticity are hugely important, or were hugely important for us. Um, if, if the community felt like we were trying to sell this as opposed to inform them about what's in it and be very specific, I think that the, there would not have been the level of trust and the faith to jump forward with this, this program. So, you know, there, there is a lot of value to transparency and specificity. Great. Well, um, I would like to get us out on time um, and, and we also want to be very mindful of your, your all's time since you're being so generous to dedicate it to us. This was great and, and we really appreciate uh, 
all the information. There's some great themes, some great specific uh, points for us to um, take away. And I want to once again, just really thank you, Jackie, Meg, and Sam for your time. Wish you all the best on moving, moving forward from here. And um, if we can ever return and the favor in any way and, and help you with anything, let us know. But uh, thanks again. And I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Thank you so Thank much. You. Good right. to see you all again. Bye. Yeah.